This evening, um, we're back in Psalm 119, as you've already heard, and we're going to be looking at this portion, verses 137 through 144. And again, the entire psalm is meant to give to us a very high appreciation for the law of God, uh, something which you've already heard has fallen into some disrepute today, sadly, even in churches, and not because, uh, you know, necessarily they, they hate the law, but because they feel compelled to say that, that this is the case, that we don't need to keep the commandments uh, because uh, that was a part of the Old Covenant, part of the Mosaic Covenant, and we're not under the Mosaic or the Old Covenant, and yet seem to forget that our Lord Jesus Christ not only repeated the commandments, but even told us the fact that till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever annuls even one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, we want to be um, great in His kingdom. That's what we're looking at this evening. So we need to be among those who actually keep, uh, keep these commandments and teach others to do the same. Uh, that is the word of our Lord. But let's read something then about the kind of appreciation we should have for the law of God from this particular portion of Psalm 119, beginning in verse 137. The psalmist writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness and exceeding faithfulness. My zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Let me submit to you that this is the heart of a man whom the Lord regarded and whom the Lord loved. Now, this morning, again, we saw the importance of having what we would call an eternal perspective rather than just our eyes on this world. Uh, the rich man we saw did very well in this life. Uh, his fields were very productive. He stored up many goods. He had a great retirement program, but he hadn't really given any thought to that life that was yet coming. His life on earth, which was really just a very small fraction of the totality of his existence, took up all of his attention while he entirely overlooked what it is that should have been most important to him, which was the state of his soul in the life to come. Uh, that portion of Scripture reminded us that we need to make sure that we look further ahead than the rich man did, that we look beyond this world, that we look to the one that is coming, that is the world that is coming as well as Christ who is coming, and that we make our choices based upon what we see is coming. And again, let me just remind you what Edwards reminded us this morning of the importance of that world that is coming, of the importance of the eternal state, considering, too, how brief a time we're actually in this world compared to how much time we're going to be spending in the eternal state. In light of that, he says, the only thing worth considering is who it is who prospers in an eternal state. I mean, compare a possible 90 years of life with 900 trillion years and, and far beyond that. What, what is there to compare? It doesn't really matter, even if we suffer for the 90 years, if we can prosper for that endless period of time we'll be spending in the eternal state. Well, I think another way that we can use this eternal perspective to help us is, is by using it as a lens to examine the things that perhaps we find to be a stumbling block in this world, uh, the things that we find to be most precious, uh, perhaps that shouldn't be precious, to show us just how valuable those things really are or really how unvaluable they are or non-valuable. I mean, think about, as Greg had already uh, had brought up and perhaps um, 
uh, you know, even prelude uh, or previewing some of the things we're going to be looking at. How often have you become jealous of the kind of people that he was referring to? Jealous of the rippling muscles of the six-pack, jealous of the, of the wealth, jealous of the popularity, jealous of the talents, the, again, the accomplishments, the famous people of the world, jealous of their looks. Well, what are these things when you examine them in the light of eternity? How much value do they really have? Well, the Bible says not much, if any. As a matter of fact, more of a stumbling block than anything else. Remember, Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If he possessed the world, it wouldn't be enough to purchase his soul. You see, the things of the Lord, the things of eternity, the things in the eternal state, the things that the Lord has to give are vastly more precious than the things of this world. God, as Edwards reminded us again, gives the material things of well, the material things to the people of this world because he knows how worthless they are. As a matter of fact, we'll have to recognize the fact that he even perhaps gives other things as well. Beauty, muscularity, <laughs> the rippling six-pack, uh, the fame, the recognition, all these things. They are of no value to the Lord, which is why people who don't know the Lord have them. We shouldn't be envying them because of these things, but rather pitying them because they place such value on them and because of what's going to happen to them, because they do. They're going to lose their souls if they don't turn to Christ. Now, you know, sometimes we even envy those who are in the church, those whom the Lord has used powerfully in the church that even the world is aware of. When we compare our own gifts our own talents, our own abilities with those of Spurgeon and his marvelous ability to communicate, or Whitfield and his powerful evangelism, or a Luther who was able to stand in the face of, of an entire church, almost an entire world, to preach the gospel, or an Edwards who had such great intellect. And we see the great things the Lord did through these men, and then we look at ourselves. You know, books were written about these men about their great exploits, while it's quite likely that we won't even find ourselves in a line of text written in the annals of history. You know, monuments have been erected in honor of, of some of these men, while perhaps there won't be much as much even as a footprint left by us. And sometimes when we look at that, we might be tempted to think that our life really doesn't have any value. They're really not going to count for anything at all. Now, if the Lord measured our worth by the splash that we make in this world, that might be true, but thankfully He doesn't. He doesn't measure it by what the world thinks of us or even what we think about one another, but rather He measures it by the love that we have for Him, which may or may not make a splash, at least in the world's eyes or in the eyes of anyone else. I think it's, it's quite likely that we may not even know the names of those whom the Lord is going to most greatly honor on that day. It may not necessarily be any of those that we recognize that will be most honored, but those whom the Lord recognizes. Remember how the, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that we need to be careful about how we practice our righteousness, that we're not seen of men. Perhaps it's those who do the most in secret that He will take most notice of, and will most greatly honor. You see, that's the most important thing is what God sees, and what it is that we are doing in our lives to bring honor to Him because the Lord tells us quite plainly uh, who it is He will honor on that day. The one who honors me, He says, I will honor. Now, if you understand this correctly, you can see that greatness is really not something that is outside of your reach, but within each of our reaches as it were. It's true that you can't change the way that God made you. It's true that you can't develop natural gifts that you don't possess or spiritual gifts that God hasn't given to you. You don't have control of your circumstances. I mean, you can't put yourself like God put Luther in the middle of that situation so that he could do the work that he did. You don't have control over those things. But one thing that you can control to a very large degree is how much you love the Lord and how much you seek to honor Him. 
with your life. Now, the measure of your love, I believe, according to Scripture, is the regard that you have not only for God, but also for His law, for His commandments. The more you love and keep that law, the more you actually love and honor Him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But the more, of course, that you uh, love and honor the Lord in this way, the more He says He will honor you. Now, I believe the, the psalmist understood this, which is why he placed such a high value on God's law. Now, tonight, what I'd like to do is consider six things from this text that you can cultivate in your hearts that will help you honor God. And of course, as you honor God, God says, I will honor you. Now, first of all, you can cultivate a high regard for God's righteousness. Secondly, a zeal for His honor. Thirdly, a love for His purity. Fourth, a desire to obey Him. Fifthly, a delight in obeying Him even during difficult times. And finally, prayer for a greater understanding of what His law actually requires so that you can live a life that is pleasing to Him. So let's consider these. Since there's six of them, we'll have to consider each of them rather briefly. First couple might be a little bit more lengthy than the, the latter ones. First of all, you need to cultivate a high regard for God's righteousness. The psalmist writes this in verses 137 and 138. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness and exceeding faithfulness. I would say the psalmist had an appreciation for the righteousness of God. Now, righteousness seems to sometimes be an elusive term that we don't quite understand. What is righteousness? Well, the righteousness, of course, is, is doing what is right. It's, it's the quality of loving what is good, what is just, and what is right, and actually doing those things. Certainly, we would say that describes God. Now, it's really that quality in God, His love for what is good and right, and the fact that He does everything right, that above all, other qualities in Him actually makes Him to be beautiful. Again, I point out that Edwards mentioned it's the same thing as holiness. It's what adorns the entire being of God and makes Him to be beautiful as He is. I know when we talk about what is beautiful, when we talk about people being beautiful, for instance, we're usually talking about their outward appearance. You know, if we say, well, this man is handsome or this woman is beautiful, we're referring to how they look outwardly and not really to their moral qualities. However, when we speak of God's beauty, we're not talking about how He looks. For one thing, God is invisible. He's a, he's a spirit. We can't see Him. For another, God could appear any way He chooses to appear, right, in whatever form He wants. He appeared in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. He appeared on one occasion as a pillar of fire, on another as a pillar of cloud. In one occasion, He even appeared as a man when He appeared to Abraham with the two angels before they went down to Sodom. Outward beauty is not important to the Lord. Inward beauty is, that is, morality. As we see in the Proverbs 31 woman, in chapter 31 of Proverbs, again, verse 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. That is the true beauty, the inward man the love of righteousness, purity, and morality. That is what makes God beautiful. His beauty is His holiness, His righteousness, His justice, His moral uprightness. I mean, consider the being of God, consider the power of God, the knowledge of God. Uh, consider all these things without the beauty of holiness, and what do you have? Take away His holiness and all you have is evil, consider what he would be like if he had such power and yet didn't have holiness. Not only would he not be beautiful, but he would be the most fearful monster that could be conceived. Now, if you love God, that is what you really love about him. It is his righteousness. But as I mentioned before, if you love his righteousness, then you're also going to love his law because it is the perfect expression of His righteousness. 
Now, by the way, that's also the reason why you love Jesus Christ, isn't it? Have you ever thought about why you love Jesus? Is it because of what He looked like? I mean, you don't even know what Jesus looked like. You don't know if, if He was handsome or not handsome, right? But you do know what He was like. You do know that His life was an example of one who kept God's law. Do you realize that that is the reason why you love Jesus Christ is because He kept the law of God? I mean, He is the example of one who did. What does it look like? It looks like Him. Is that attractive? Well, you love Jesus Christ, right? So you know that kind of life is attractive. Righteousness is beautiful. Now, do you want to be great in God's eyes? Well, then you need to live like Jesus lived. His Father loved Him because of His great love for Him and His high regard for His law. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Why was He pleased with Him? Because the Son was submitting Himself to His Father's law, doing His will perfectly from a heart that loved Him perfectly. If you do that, God will also have a high regard for you. He will love you more if you do the same. Yes, God does actually love some more and some less. Although He loves all of His children, we do know there are favorites, even as Jesus had His favorites. And His favorites are those who love Him more and show that love through their obedience. So, first of all, you need to cultivate a high regard for righteousness, for that love and beauty of God. That makes you great in God's eyes. Secondly, cultivate a zeal for God's honor. Verse 139, my zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten your words. Now, you know when you love somebody or when you even love something, when you have a high regard for, for something or someone, it, it hurts you when somebody belittles that person or that thing. Now, the psalmist had a very high regard for God, and he very, had a very high regard for His law, so it shouldn't surprise us that when he saw his adversaries breaking God's commandments, it made his anger rise. Now, we're not talking about fleshly anger. Uh, vindictive anger, we're talking about righteous anger, an anger that desired that this dishonor that was done to God be righted, as well, of course, as the one who was doing what they were doing, that they might repent for their own well-being. Now, don't you think that it's pleasing, that it really pleases the Lord to see your own heart stirred when He is offended? I mean, if God is clearly offended and you stand there just totally indifferent to it, do you think that pleases God? But if you're jealous for His glory, if you have a zeal for His honor, if your heart is stirred, that pleases Him. Again, think about the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did He do when He went into the temple of God and He saw what they had turned His Father's house of prayer into? This den of thieves. Zeal for His house consumed Him. It stirred him up to do something about it. Basically, he made the, uh, the, the whip and he drove them all out. He cleansed the temple of all that thievery. Now, again, the Lord isn't saying if you find a church that's doing something like that, go ahead and make a whip and drive everybody out. We do need to realize that Jesus had a certain amount of authority and that house belonged to him. He was the son over the house. He was the owner of the house. He had the right to do what he did. He's not saying that we should do that, but we should be zealous. We should have a response that is consistent, at least with our place, with our particular authority, whatever it may be. Jesus' zeal pleased his Father. Now, again, how do you respond when you see God's law set aside or when you see it forgotten? You know, it's interesting, this word forgotten, they have forgotten your law. The psalmist may have been referring to someone within the church that had forgotten the law, that he's, his adversaries were those actually within the Old Testament church, within the covenant community. You can't forget something you don't know. They knew it, but they didn't do it. And that's really what forgetting means. It doesn't mean they just forgot what God had said, but they conveniently set it aside so that they could do what they wanted to do. Now, it's hard enough to see this happening outside the church in this increasingly wicked society in which we're living. 
but it's even harder to see those who name the name of Jesus Christ set it aside so they can do what they want to do instead of what God wants them to do. Now, if you would be great in God's eyes, you need to be offended by these things. Again, not vindictive, but offended for His honor. And do what you can to repair His honor. To, even as our Lord Jesus Christ, when He saw the Pharisees and their interpretations of the law had, had basically covered up God's original meaning, how He did what He could to lift it back up to its original state. You have heard it said, but I say to you, we need to do what we can to repair His honor because God honors those who stand up for Him. So we need to have a high regard for His righteousness and we need to be zealous for His honor. That makes you great in God's eyes. Thirdly, you need to cultivate a love for purity. He says in verse 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. And I don't think we need to see by this anything differently than what we've already seen as far as loving the righteousness of these commandments because they reflect the righteous character of God. But I just wanted this to be a further reminder to each one of us that to love God's law means that we love it because it is pure. Uh, pure in what sense? Pure in the sense that it requires absolute rightness or righteousness and forbids everything wrong. It forbids all sin, everything that is hateful and requires everything that is good and right, everything that is loving. Now, if you love God's law because of its, of its purity and not in spite of it, that honors God. I mean, people can love the law of God for a variety of reasons, I suppose. It perhaps gives them clout in the church or, you know, maybe there were times in society when living that kind of life would actually get you ahead, although it wouldn't necessarily do that today. But loving God's law for that reason isn't the right reason. You need to love it because of its purity, because it forbids all sin and requires everything that is good and right, and you will love that if you really love God, if you really have His Spirit living in you, and if you do love the law of God for that reason, that honors God, and God will honor you. Fourthly, if you want to be great in God's eyes, you do need to cultivate obedience, submission to this law, and of course, that's what you'll do if you love it. He says in verse 141, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. And of course, what he meant was they forgot it, they weren't doing it, they conveniently set it aside, but I don't forget it. I remember it to do it. Now, notice the psalmist's view of himself. I am small and despised. He didn't consider himself to be great, not in God's eyes, not in the church's eyes, not in the world's eyes, and not even in his own eyes. He wasn't proud but rather he was humble. Does that sound familiar, humility? Humility is, is the road to greatness, remember? And that's why he took the role of a servant and kept God's commandments. And this made him great in God's eyes. You know, oftentimes people don't, even Christians don't want to keep the commandments of God because somehow they think they're better than the commandments. Somehow it's beneath them to do that. Well, if we're true believers, I think the Lord will humble us if we have that kind of an attitude to show us just how important it is that we follow the Lord in this path of humility and in obedience. Now, as I said at the beginning, we may not be among the great people of the world. We may not have that outward beauty. We may not have the greatest gifts or talents, positions, wealth. We might not have great spiritual gifts. We may not be given great opportunities in the church to serve the Lord, but that doesn't mean that we can't be great in God's eyes. He looks for love, love for Him, love for His law. He looks for zeal. He looks zeal for His glory and honor, zeal for His law. He looks for the one who loves purity. He looks for the one who is humble. He looks for the one who remembers His law and obeys it. So do you want to be great in God's eyes? These are the things you need to cultivate. 
but yet we still have two more. If you want to be great in God's eyes, you do need to cultivate obedience even during the difficult times when it's not so easy to obey. Verses 142 and 143, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. You know, it's easy to obey the Lord when everybody else is obeying, you know, when it's, it's popular. It's easy to serve the Lord when people applaud you for so doing. But what about when obeying means that people are going to persecute you? Uh, such was the case in the life of Jesus. The more he honored his father, the more his own people hated him. Such was the case of Moses. When he stood before Pharaoh and declared what God wanted, it, it meant difficulty. It wasn't an easy thing to obey him under those circumstances. And what about Stephen when he was standing before the council? And he was declaring the fact that they had murdered their own Messiah and indicted them for it. That must not have been an easy thing to do, knowing that his life was in their hands. Well, the one who is pleasing to God is, and the one who is great in his eyes is the one who is willing to obey him even when it isn't popular, even when it is difficult, even when you run the risk of being hated, scorned, abused, injured, even killed. If you want honor in God's eyes, then you need to set your heart to obey Him, no matter what the cost may be to you personally. If that's your heart, God will honor you. That uh, He sees as something that is great. And then finally, if you would be great in God's eyes, you need to pray for a greater understanding of His commandments so that you can live that life that is pleasing to Him. He says in verse 144, your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Now, I think here it's important to understand because, you know, you, you, well, we run into people all the time, and perhaps you do as well, that uh, believe that they're living according to God's law, but really don't even understand what it says. Okay, it's not enough to live according to what you think God wants. If you would be great in His eyes, you actually need to do what the Lord says. So you need to pray that God would open your eyes to what His commandments really say, to what His Word really says. Pray that you might uh, not only know their meaning, what it is they're actually saying, but pray for a heart to keep them, uh, to live by them. Uh, and if you do, of course, if you live by them, then I think the other sense in which the psalmist may actually mean this, give me understanding that I may live, remember his life was being threatened by his adversaries. And he realized that God's promises of protection and blessing only applied to those who obeyed. And so he says, give me understanding that I may live. In other words, let me understand what it is you want me to be and what you want me to do and I'll do it. And then I will acquire or as it were apprehend this blessing that you have for me. I know that you will protect me as I seek to honor you. Now, you see, if you seek to honor God in this way, He will honor you. Some of the Puritans were actually um, uh, censured. They were um, rebuked, hated, because they were called the picky people, the particular people, the, the holier-than-thou kind of people. And the reason why they were called that was because they took God's Word seriously. They wanted to understand what he actually said, and they wanted to try to conform to this word just as closely as they possibly could. So they, they tried to themselves, and then, of course, as other people saw them, they would feel convicted by that, and of course, as they ministered the word to other people, they were convicted by that, and uh, that's often the response we get, but yet that is really what honors the Lord, is being as careful as we possibly can be to do what we know is honoring to the Lord and to stay away from those things that we know are dishonoring to Him or even things that may be doubtful. The Bible says that whatever is not done in faith is actually sin. And even if that thing isn't necessarily a wrong thing, if we might think there might, you know, it might be wrong, we shouldn't do it. We have to be able to do it in faith. And so if you seek to live this kind of life, if you seek to honor God in this way, He will honor you. 
And so to sum up, you may not have the greatest natural gifts. You may not have the greatest resources, the greatest intellect, the greatest position, the greatest beauty or wealth. You may not have the greatest spiritual gifts or the greatest opportunities to serve the Lord, but that doesn't mean that you can't stand out in His eyes. As we saw in our meditation, God doesn't look at the outside. He doesn't look at the outward beauty of a man. He doesn't even look at, at the wealth or the authority and all these other things. Remember, those are worthless to God. He gives them to people who don't even know Him. God looks at the inside. That's what is most important to Him. And if you have a high regard for His righteousness, if you are zealous for His honor, if you love His purity, if you will remember His law and actually do it, whether during good times or difficult times, if you will seek Him for the wisdom to know and apply His commandments, He will certainly notice you and He will honor you and you will be great in His eyes. If that is what you desire, this is what you need to do. Follow His Son. Follow His example. You need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins to enter the kingdom of heaven. But once you enter, the honor the Lord gives to you largely depends on what you do with your life. Live this kind of life and God will notice you and you will be great in His eyes. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, to help us, uh, to help us do the very best that we can to honor Him in this life. Again, let's remember the eternal perspective. It may not matter as much to us right now, but it certainly will on that day. So let's look forward to that day and seek the kind, to live the kind of life He would have us to live now so that we might receive honor on that day.